substance to the molecular level and then rebuild it again synthetically if they choose to do so. Right? And so that's pretty cool, right? But not when it comes to essential oils. And I'll explain why. These two scientists are actually from Cornell University and they wanted to take honey and break honey down to the molecular level and rebuild honey synthetically. Okay, so, which is a cool idea, I guess, if you like synthetic honey. Their idea was to be able to create this product that could be last hundreds of years, have enzymatic and amino acids and antibodies that are help support wellness in our bodies, right? That's really cool. But guess what happened when they put the honey on the shelf next to the real honey? About six months later, that honey spoiled. Sorry, that was not a technical term, right? Anyway, that honey spoiled, and it, and it didn't have all of the desirable properties that the real honey had. So that got me to thinking, why? Why does it matter? Why does it matter to you? Why do you care? Why do I care? Okay, I'm gonna veer a little bit. We're gonna go way off, and I'm gonna talk about love. Yeah, dangerous subject, love. What is it about love? Is it physics? Is it physical, maybe? Is it chemistry? You know, I have good chemistry. So love is going to work? Is it biology? Is it dedication, devotion, service? It's all of these, right? It's everything put together in a perfect balance. So now I want to come back to honey. How is it that that bee produces honey? Well, he comes to a flower, and he gets the nectar, and he's all excited, and he loves it, and he's just covered in nectar, right? And he sucks the nectar in, and it gets in his stomach, and it starts to rejuvenate with the juices and the acids and the amino acids and the enzymes and everything's going crazy in his stomach and then all of a sudden bleh, the bee throws it up and we eat it with gusto yeah <laughs> it's awesome we love honey who loves honey right so so that's the thing but it's a process that can only happen naturally right it can only happen in the natural stomach of the bee the same thing happens with essential oils. Laboratories should be used to confirm the purity and the constituency and the quality of essential oil. Laboratories should never be used to make essential oil. Does that make sense? Right? So in our laboratories, if you get a chance to listen to Dr. Book, I'm not going to steal his thunder. He's awesome. But there's a gazillion ways that we test to ensure purity and accuracy and quality of our essential oils to ensure that they are authentic. Right? Authentic matters. All right, now I'm going to talk a little bit about natural sustainable crop production and production practices that are not sustainable and natural. Okay, so you'll see some pictures in the top row that are not sustainable and ones in the bottom that are. Here we have a field that's just encumbered with weeds, lots of weeds. How many of you have a garden? Gardens, yeah? When you first started your garden, it was a hard as a rock and, and, and nothing could grow and you couldn't really till it or dig in it. If that's the case of your garden, then pay attention because we're going to solve your garden woes right now. Okay? So all the weeds and insects, critical is an effective integrated pest management program. I know it's a big long jumble of letters. Integrated Pest Management Program. So I get asked all the time, how do you manage weeds? Well, of course, we spray herbicide on everything. No, we don't do that. Okay, we do not use herbicides. What do we use? It's a very difficult question to answer, and here's why. It's not a question I can answer with just a, a one statement. Why? Because we grow crops all over the world. And in Australia, I deal with a certain population of weeds and insects. And in Mona, Utah, I deal with an entirely different population of weeds and insects and diseases. And in Ecuador, it's a whole other myriad of pests and problems. And oh, and then we go to Taiwan, and then we go over to, right? It's everywhere, and, and everywhere is a little bit different. 
So it's a challenge because it's not one shoe fits everybody. It's not one natural sustainable practice that solves every problem. I'll give you an example, we had a little insect that was chewing on the ylang ylang tree in Ecuador. So I get a call from Orlando, our fields manager there. He says, hey, we can't, we can't figure this out. It's killing the ylang ylang tree, what do we do? So as a team, we all go to work on finding a natural enemy of that insect. Is it a plant? Is it another insect? Is it something that we can do organically to, to make it work? We found that a particular variety of clover is not preferred by that insect. So we have a double, double bonus. We get rid of the insect by planting in this clover as a companion crop. And clover is a legume. That means it can take nitrogen. You know, the air we're breathing is 80% nitrogen. Did you know that? It's not all oxygen that we're breathing in. There's some nitrogen in that air. And the legumes can take nitrogen out of the air and fix it into NO3 in the soil so that the plants can, can take that out. So the clover provides nitrogen to the ylang ylang tree and helps us to get rid of this insect, right? So that's just one example. But if we were to list them all, there's probably a thousand different approaches that we use as a part of our integrated pest management program, okay? It's, it's very involved. But if you have questions, specific issues, whatever, call me, email me, I don't care, whatever. We're happy to answer your questions, okay? All right, so then we're looking at the soil. We talked about your garden, how it had really soil that was not very favorable. When Gary arrived at the farm in Mona, the soil was very inert, basically dead, okay? And so we've got soil that had been tilled for years, so there was no soil structure, no organic carbon in the soil. And because there's no organic carbon, what happens to your dog if you don't feed it? Dog dies, right? Well, with no organic carbon in the soil, all the microbes die, all the fungi, all the worms, everything dies, and so then the soil is just dead. Well, in order to fix that, and, and it's a tragedy because what happens when we farm, yeah, it's a great thing, but many of the farming practices are also have a negative side. For example, when we till the ground, we till, we're rolling in our tractor, and here I go, I'm flying in my tractor, and I love it, and I'm looking back, and I see the dust flying up. And what does that mean? That means that I've just broken up soil structure, I've released carbon into the atmosphere. I've killed microbes and worms. Okay, and so while I need to prepare a seed bed, I've got all that negative going on. So how do we farm sustainably when some of our practices have an adverse effect? We have to give back to Mother Earth in the form of compost, mulch, cover crops, and give back to Mother Earth that organic carbon the microbes, the worms, to be able to create a sustainable environment to grow. Okay, and so then we have a soil that starts to rebuild soil structure, starts to have organic carbon for the microbes to grow and live in, right? We have to manage our irrigation. We have to manage our soil so that the water will infiltrate. We have to schedule our irrigation so that we don't have runoff and leaching and create erosion. Many of the crops that we grow are perennials. That means that they grow year after year after year after year, and we come along with our tractor and we harvest and it grows again, and we harvest again, and everybody's happy. And what happens about 10 years down the road is the plants all the while down in the roots, they're kicking out chelates and acids into the soil to free up nutrients so they can eat, and that's really cool. But after a while, it creates a condition called phytotoxicity and the plant starts to kill itself to save the soil because we've just mined all the nutrients from the soil. And that's what's happening in the top. So we have to rotate our crops every so often. Every time we rotate, we put in a multi-species cover crop that we're going to invert as a green manure. And, and I have a favorite saying, you're gonna laugh, doer, tour, manure, right? So we throw it out there and we want it to go to work. In this multi-species cover crop, we have three different legumes, or four 
legumes, two different types of clover, hairy vetch and cowpea, not cowpea, but the cowpea, right? So the cowpea is out there, the hairy vetch, the clover, fixing nitrogen out of the atmosphere, putting it into the soil, and that's really awesome. We also have in Mona soils. So this is one of the things. The cover crop blend that we use in Mona will not be the same blend of crops that we use in Highland Flats in Idaho, or that we use in Australia, or that we use in France. Okay, it's, we look at the conditions of the soil, and we select the crops that go in that cover crop specific to that soil. In Mona, we grow lavender, and so one of the species that we want in that cover crop is actually oregano. That's interesting. Why? Oregano roots foster the development and reproduction of mycorrhizal fungi. And those little fungi help to build and grow healthy lavender plants, and we love it. Okay? So then, once this multi species cover crop grows up, oh, one more thing, we have a lot of compaction. We put into that mix two more types of plants. One is a tillage radish. It's this big white tap root that goes down and breaks up construct, uh, compaction. And for lack of a better term, that radish has inside of it some goo. Everybody loves goo, right? So goo goes into the soil and it helps to build soil structure. It helps to reduce compaction. We also have a little bug or a little worm in the, in the soil in Mona called a nematode. And the nematode is a little critter that chews on the roots. There's good nematodes and bad nematodes. And we need the good nematodes because they help break down organic matter and make nutrients available to plants. But the little bad guys chew on the roots. In our cover crop, we have sorghum, sedan grass, and mustard. And both of those plants, when we till them under, give off cyanide gas naturally, and that acts as a fumigant to kill the little bad nematode guy, right? And so now naturally, we don't, we don't have to spray a chemical out there, we've just taken care of the nematode in a natural, sustainable way. It's not easy, it's not inexpensive, it is very expensive, and sometimes to find these different practices is very painstaking. We have to study and, and learn, and oh, wouldn't it be terrible if we had to pick up a phone and do a little bit of research and study and read, right? But we do that, and then we put it to work. We, we set up at our, all of our farms, we have a research room, and that's an area where we're studying different practices, different crops, different things, and we're always learning. Once we get that cover crop tilled in as a green manure, we then put on 20 ton per acre of compost. Put that organic carbon back into the field so that then we're ready to come back and plant lavender, hyssop, blue yarrow, goldenrod, all of the crops that we plant. Every year we plant just over 2 million plants in our greenhouse to transplant into the field just at our Mona farm. That's just one farm. Do we have time to do that one plant at a time? That's like somebody going to a coffee shop. One coffee bean, two coffee beans. Right, it takes forever. But guess what? It's important. And we do it. We get in a big tractor and we're cruising along and there's two guys sitting on the back and they're dropping plants in a hole. And then somebody comes behind and makes sure that every single plant got covered with just the right amount of dirt and that it's just at the right depth to be able to take, take on life. And we think about all the care and effort that we go to to give that plant life. And I want you to realize that that plant is now prepared to give life back to you in the form of essential oils. Way cool, way cool. Irrigation management in areas that are water deficient, like Mona, like Idaho, we have to irrigate, right? And so when we irrigate, we have to manage that system to make sure that we get good distribution uniformity. Uh, in a prior uh, career, I used to manage a lot of irrigation on very, very large farms, and it was very interesting. You get one area of the, of the irrigation line that would put down an inch and a half of water, and water is just running off the field, 
in another area of the same irrigation line that's not getting any water. Right, very poorly managed. So to manage it well, we've got to maintain it, ensure proper distribution uniformity, schedule irrigation so that it's getting the right amount of water for the crop, for the depth of the roots, for the soil type, so that that plant can grow, and as stewards of the earth, so that we can take care of the water. We also work on high efficiency irrigation methods, like drip irrigation, um, lead by Lisa systems that can deliver water in a more efficient manner. All right, give it up for cover crops. How many of you are familiar with cover crops? Okay, this is where we live and die. This is where we have success or we fail. If we don't have any cover crops, then we're not doing a good job of farming sustainably, okay? So in one question, I can go to a new farm that we might be considering to purchase or, or to work with. Tell me about your cover crop program. If they don't have a cover crop program, then we help educate them, right? We share with them the six sex that we're having and help them to establish that program on their farm. So what this is, we have a weed barrier right in the plant row that helps to eliminate weeds so that we don't have to go out and weed by hand, right? Because part of being sustainable is also being profitable. And if we're not profitable in our crop production practices, because we've got so much labor out there manually weeding, then that can't be sustainable either. It's, it's a balance. So we have a weed barrier that's right in the plant row so that we can grow pure lavender plants. And we do this in all of our crops that are a hedge, hedgerow crop, like lavender, hyssop, melissa, right? In between the rows, we'll grow a cover crop. And in this case, there are four different species of, of plants. Sheep fescue, two types of clover, and a bird's foot trefoil. Those are all, all legumes, except for the fescue. So they're fixing nitrogen to help feed the crop, and they're providing biodiversity with their root systems. Normally, after about seven or eight years, we have to rotate the lavender to eliminate the hazard of phytotoxicity. When we put in the inter-row cover crops, we can extend the life of the stand by an additional three years because we've got biodiversity in the soil, much more healthy for the soil to grow. Okay, I gotta take a break. I'm gonna tell you a story. <clears throat> when I was a kid, um, well, how many of you like homemade bread? Yeah, homemade bread, awesome. So when I was a kid, I loved homemade bread and I used to live about an hour, a mile from the school. And I get out of school and I'm walking home, doo -doo 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 -doo, and all of a sudden I catch on the breeze the hint of homemade bread. <gasps> Mom's making bread. <laughs> and I run home, right? Bust through the door, mom's got homemade bread slices and honey ready to go. And I'm just wolfing it down, love homemade bread. Several years later, I go to college and my roommates are like, we're hungry, you know? Every college roommate is hungry. Anyway, they're hungry, we wanna make some bread. I said, oh, well my mom knows how to make bread, I call her, so I call her, mom, how do we make bread? She says, oh yeah, you gotta put in some flour and sugar and, and yeast and all the stuff and mix it up and throw it in the oven. Oh cool, so I get some sugar and flour and water and yeast and a little bit of baking powder, mix it all up and throw it in the oven and guess what? Pull it out of the oven. Uh, knock, knock, knock. It's hard as a rock, and it would have been better served as a doorstop. So I called mom. Mom, what happened? The bread, it didn't turn out like I remember. She says, oh, well, you've got to have the water at exactly 112 degrees. And then you've got to put in a little bit of sugar and put the yeast and allow that to... Marinate, I don't know the right term, right? So anyway, allow it to, to grow. And then you can put your flour and, and you get it in and then you've got to knead it. Well, I knead it, believe me. No, she says, you got to knead it. And then you got to put it in a bowl and let it rise. And beat it down and let it rise. And I'm thinking, really? <sighs> so I leave the bread making to mom. But when I farm essential oils and crops to produce, 
produce essential oils. There is a very specific way that we have to go about it to ensure that we get the highest quality and yield of essential oils. About two weeks before the prime growth stage, we come into the field and we start to test the plants to make sure that, I don't know how to explain this, make sure the plant has gone through puberty. Does that help make sense? Make sure it's mature and develop all of the proper constituents of essential oils. That that plant has been able to give the full expression of essential oils that are written in its DNA, right? So we go out there, we test, we know we're at the right growth stage, we know that it's there. When I met Gary, I was so excited because I finally met somebody that liked to work harder than I did. I got to tell another story, I hope I don't go way over, but I got to tell you a story. I'm with Gary at the Highland Flats farm. It was right after I had started, and I thought, oh, I'm going to impress the boss, right? I'm going to get up early. Set my alarm for 4 o'clock. I thought, I'll get up at 4 o'clock, and I'll go into the mess hall, and I'll make breakfast, and it'll be awesome, and won't he be impressed, right? So I get up at 4 o'clock, and I'm being really quiet, and I get my boots on, and I hop out the door, and I go in, and he's already got breakfast made, right? He was already up. He's already in there getting it going doing the dishes and I thought wow what an honor to work for a man who has a vision to serve others and about his entire career he was serving others and when I came to Young Living just a little over two years ago already we're at the size of millions yet every time I saw him he took time for the one when he would engage with you, he was talking to you, to me, to the one. What an inspiration. Okay, back on to the story. So we got this, these crops. If you think about tulips and dandelions, right? When it's sunshine and they're all wide out, open in their splendor, right? Given and you can smell the aroma from half a block away, oh, coming up on these beautiful flowers. What happens when the barometric pressure drops and the clouds come over and it starts to rain? That tulip closes up and the dandelion closes up. Where do all that, does it, does it still smell nice? Maybe a little bit, I mean it's got some lingering effect, but all of those essentials go into the crown. So when I was excited to tell Gary, hey Gary, we can get up at four o'clock, go harvest. No says it's kind of like bread, right? You got to do it at exactly the right time in exactly the right way in order for it to produce pure, high quality essential oils, to get all of the constituents, not just some of the constituents. So when we're harvesting, we start testing beforehand, and then all of a sudden our distillery manager says, go, all the conditions are right. 10 o'clock in the morning, we start harvesting. We're still testing while we're harvesting. And if the conditions change, we stop and wait until the conditions are right. Then we come into the distillery and we distill these plant material at just the right temperature, at just the right pressure, for just the right amount of time. And wouldn't it be nice if one size fits all? But no, there's what, a thousand products that we sell and probably 600 different types of plants that we distill and everyone is different. Everyone is unique. Everyone has its own temperature, pressure, time that's critical in order to produce the right essential oils. How do we know all that? Guess what, Young Living is the pioneer of essential oils. Gary Young has been studying this from early on, and, and you know what? I get, I get asked, all the time, did Gary teach you everything that you know about the production of essential oils? Well, guess what? He didn't, he didn't just give me a fish to eat. He taught me how to fish, right? So every time we go into the greenhouse and we're talking about seed and, and we walk in and he's right behind me and pretty quick I don't hear him anymore, I turn around and Gary's in a plant, right? I mean, he's in it. He's, smelling it and going, going on, and then pretty quick he's yanking it right out of the pot, and he's looking at the roots. 
Are there fine root hairs? Are the roots big? We have some fields that the roots turn over to the side like this. Why would they do that? Heavy compaction, right? The, the roots can't even grow through that soil. And so with all of that, and then he says, here, taste. So they'd make me eat the roots. And you laugh, but guess what? I learned something about the plant. This one's bitter. That one's sweet. This one's tart. That one doesn't taste like anything. And you, I mean, it's not like don't eat yellow snow, right? You just want to make sure that, was this compost cured, right, before I? Mm -hmm. Okay, now you're gonna go there. You just kind of have to bear with me. But that was Gary, right? He wanted me to think like a plant. So I want you to learn how to think like a plant. I, I apologize for killing this plant, but you're gonna have to sit right there for a minute. Okay, so the cool thing, I completely forgot what I was talking about. <laughs> I guess we get to tell a story. So one of the things about this, when Gary would taste and test and get to know the plants, he wanted me to be able to think like a plant, so I want you to do that. Put your hand up to your mouth, and I want you to press it over your lips, and just lightly breathe through your fingers. Come on, everybody in the back, breathe through your fingers. Okay, now press your hand tight against your mouth and try to breathe. Can you breathe? Can you eat? Can you drink? This is how the plant feels. If it's in soils that are compacted, no structure, no water, no, no microorganisms. So um, the soil, what do you see? Probably dead center, there's two earthworms, okay? And for what's really cool, I got my box here full of earthworms, okay? For the, you probably can't see very well, but just kidding. Okay? But I want you to see and get a visual from my earthworms for what you can't see in the soil. Well, what is it that we can't see? What? The pore space. Okay, we got the pore space for air and water, the structure. We've got, in Mona, when Gary started, it was a dead soil. And we're working on reviving it so that it's a living soil. I was recently evaluating a potential farm to purchase because, believe it or not, Young Living is growing at a, at a rate and a pace that we are having a hard time keeping up, right? And so we have, to, we have currently a five by five goals. Has everybody heard of those? One of them is to develop five new farms every year. So I'm out investigating, looking at a farm, and, and I go there, and this happened to be in a kind of a tropical region, and I asked the farm manager, how much fertilizer do you put on? He says, well, we haven't fertilized these fields in eight years. I said, what, no fertilizer? He says, yeah, we don't have to. And I look around, and his crops are just vibrant and growing, way healthy, I'm like, what? And I, and I go over there, and I pull a Gary, right? I grab one of his plants and I yank it out of the ground. And he's looking at me like, who is this guy? And I'm eating the roots and I'm, you know, anyway. I'm into it. I'm like investigating. How is it you can grow plants without all these chemicals? And he says, we don't do chemicals. And I'm like, awesome. Well, guess what? When I pulled the plant out of the ground, just like in my worm box, the, ground, the whole earth just started to move. And I was like, what? And I grab a magnifying glass, and there is just insects and bugs and mycorrhizal fungi and bacteria and all this stuff going on. And he says, yeah, we don't have to put fertilizer on because we're naturally sustainable. And we're learning about the microbiome of the soil and how critical it is to have a living soil that can take that organic matter and convert it into plant nutrients. And, and, it, and it lives sustainably. And that's where we're headed, and that's what we're working on, is natural, sustainable crop production. One of the cool things Gary taught me is uh, farming is not a spectator sport. So guess what? I need, I need some help. Right? Right here, I need one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Come with me, yep. Hurry fast, because I don't have much time. 
they're going to kick me off because I tell too many stories. So anyway, I need four on either side. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about planting. Okay, got to hurry. Sorry to rush you. So one of the really cool things about crop production, and I want to I want to share with you this experience, and I wish that all of you could come up here with me. If you, how many of you have been to the farm at Mona? Or are going, right? You'll get a chance to plant some plants there. Come to our farms, come to our events, get a hold of us, come have your personal experience. Why? Because you're going to get passionate like I'm passionate. And you're going to find that your why matters. Not only to you, but it matters to anybody you come into contact with. Because you have an opportunity to bring a greater state of wellness in a natural state to a higher level. All right, here we go. So everybody on my side is going to cup your hands. And everybody on my side is going to pick up the little plant. And I want you to be observant. i got to find, sorry, pardon me, I'm not getting frisky, just getting, here we go. So... Notice that in, when you get a plant at the, at the nursery, sometimes they're root bound, right? So be observant about your plant. Is it wet? Is it dry? How are the roots? If it's root bound, you gotta break it up, give it some oxygen. It can't breathe, right? So you gotta, you gotta do that. So if you need to break up the bottom a little bit, right, tease those roots, get them a little up, awesome. Okay, now everybody on my side, oh, rough it up, give it a smell. This, these are little baby lavender plants. Can everybody smell it? Oh, sorry, pull out your lavender oil. Yeah, good stuff. All right, so everybody on my side, cup hands, put your plants down though. Plants down. Okay, my side, cup hands. This side, you're gonna plant it into their hands and then dress some soil all around it to give it a foundation. So plant, plant some soil in around it to help it be Found it? Yeah, very good. Throw some dirt in your hair. It's all good, right? So we want to get that foundation, and then you're going to dig a hole underneath so that they have a place to plant it. Now, I want you to think about the opportunity that we have is that all the things we do to take care of these plants, and to take care of the soil, and to take care of the water, and all of the care that we give to give that plant life, that that plant is now prepared to give life back to you in the form of essential oils, right? All right, go ahead and plant that in. We don't have much time, and then we got to switch. So we're going to trade. So go ahead and plant. Yep, awesome. Very good. And now, everybody on my side, cupped hands. And go ahead and plant in. Perfect. And then you'll plant down. So for those of you who are doing gardening, you get this experience from time to time. If you don't have a garden, fine, go get a pot at the grocery store, at the whatever store you go to, a nursery, and plant a plant and have it in your windowsill. I really encourage you to get in touch with nature and have a plant. And if you're like me, for whatever reason, little potted plants in the windowsill, I can't keep a single one alive. I don't have a green thumb in the house. Take me to the field and we're awesome, but anyway. Everybody has different strengths, right? Tell me how it goes. All right, so go ahead and dig it in and plant it in. And very good. Big hand round of applause for my helpers. All right, sorry to kick you guys off. I appreciate your help very much. Thank you. So with everything that I've learned from Gary Young and all that he's taught me, I would like to share with you a little bit more than just the natural sustainable crop production. Gary really has inspired me to be a better human being, to look to the one, to serve one another, to help, to ask questions, to be inspired, to find answers. And he taught me how to search. He taught me how to connect with other people that know way more than I do and study together and learn together and share. And so this is what I would like to share with you is a little more about what he taught me. I think our audio didn't go.
dad's back to use them. If not, I'm just going to finish up in my own mode, if that's okay. Oh, here we go. We're close. There was the end here. All right.
Nationally sustainable farming practices render the highest quality and yield of essential oils. Everything that we do at Young Living is all about people. And share your why. So to close, I can sum everything up that I've learned from Gary Young in this one statement. And I'm, I, I don't want to mess it up because it's his quote, so I'm going to read it if you'll bear with me. God has given us something important. Not only the seeds we plant, the crops we grow, and the natural resources that we use to grow them, but also the knowledge, the tools, and technologies we apply. The colleagues we work with and the people that we serve. So remember that when we cultivate our fields, grow our crops, distill our wells, manage our teams, and interact with all the people that we come into contact with, that we must care about how we do it. Thank you.